As the number of cases of coronavirus rises in the U.S., the number of daily deaths is still dropping from the peak of the country's outbreak in mid-April. For more on this, we're joined by emergency care physician Dr. Ron Elfenbein. He's going to help us break this down. So, doctor, uh, what do you make of the declining rate of deaths? Well, obviously, I think it's a great thing. Um, there's a couple of theories about that. One is that it's affecting younger people more predominantly now, um, although the data is kind of tough to, to be sure about that. But it looks like that the numbers of people that are being infected are on the lower end of the age spectrum. So those people tend to have a tendency to be more survivable when they get the virus. Um, the, other, the other thing is an interesting theory postulated by an Italian physician that the virus is actually weakening and that it's, it's becoming less dangerous to people. Whether or not, there's no data for this that I'm aware of. It was just an interesting theory I just read about last night. Um, it's certainly worth investigating and looking at, but as far as I know, there's no data to support that. But obviously, the fact that less people are dying is a wonderful thing, and I think that whatever the reason is, we, it, it's a great thing, and we should uh, all be very thankful for that. So New York City, which was once the epicenter of this uh, virus here, it's uh, entering another phase of reopening. And it means about 300,000 people are going to be heading into the city to go to work. They're going to be taking public transportation. They're going to be using public bathrooms. Um, I don't know if we're getting a ton of guidance. So I'm going to ask you, you know, what are some of the things that you, you should keep in mind um, to make sure that you, you limit your risk and you limit the risk to others around you? Well, I, I think the first and foremost thing is people have to take this into perspective. I mean, I, I drive all the time, and I see people driving next to me with their phones, texting, looking down, way more dangerous than yeah. getting on a train <gasps> with other people. So you got to put this into perspective globally and kind of look at it as a gestalt type of thing, right? I mean, driving and texting or driving drunk or something like that is just stupid and dangerous. So, yes, you should be aware of the fact that if you're getting on a train with lots of other people, your risk is a little bit higher. It doesn't mean you're going to catch coronavirus, and it doesn't mean you're going to die from coronavirus. But be smart about it. When you get off the train, carry some hand sanitizer, wash your hands, wear a mask, try to stay away from other people if you can. It doesn't mean you can't talk to people. It doesn't mean you can't be friendly with other people. It just means try to stay away and try not to cough on people and try not to get coughed on, things like that. Just be very smart and uh, put it all into perspective. You know, your, your chance of getting this from getting on a, a subway is still pretty small. So. You know, you don't have to be crazy about it, but just be smart and do the things that the experts are telling you. Wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, wear a mask, and practice social distancing. These things will keep you safe. It's been shown time and time again. And you don't have to go crazy about this, but just be smart and, and use, you know, use common sense. You know, Doctor, the, I think it's important, though, we sort of teased it um, before uh, you joined us, which is this concept, this idea that there's this second wave coming when, in fact, we're not out of the first wave yet. I think that That's that, right. and, and it strikes me, it strikes me that the reason people feel that way is because of the message that we've gotten at the very top of our political leaders, the president of the United States, which for uh, quite some time downplayed the risks. And so uh, what I see now are people, even as cities are reopening, which is a great thing, trying to get the economy back up and running is, is very important. Yeah. But I think that people are, are less vigilant than they could be because of the messaging. And that has me worried. The fact that we are talking about a second wave when we're still not out of the first one. Yeah, Vlad, I think that's a really good point. We're not out of the first wave, so there's really kind of it's pointless to talk about a second wave because we're still in the first wave. Uh, your, your point is very valid that if you look at the numbers, and as I said before, I, I believe that the, the majority of these cases tend to be in younger people. And why is that? Well, you know, there's a sense of invincibility. There's the sense of I don't need to. I mean, if you look at the the pictures and the and the, it's all anecdotal, but if you look at the pictures of people going out on the beaches and stuff, and no one's wearing masks, no one's practicing social distancing. They're all just kind of milling about. And you know, the fact that things are reopening now, people are are tending to be more complacent than they should be. I'm I'm not suggesting that we all need to be crazy about this and 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 you know, put ourselves in a plastic bubble. But at the same time, we need to do what the experts are telling us, which is wear a mask, wash your hands, and practice social distancing. I mean, it's not that difficult. But I think the millennial generation is a tough generation to reach. And, and the, I, you know, looking at the demographics, they're not watching programs like this. They're getting their data and their, their information from 
Twitter and from Facebook and from social media. And it's a very hard demographic to reach because they have short attention spans for the most part, and they don't really pay attention to authority figures for the most part. So it's difficult to kind of get the message across. So I, I've heard some government institutions trying to get, you know, enlist professional athletes and, and actors and things like that that maybe can communicate better with the younger generations to try to, to, to get that message across because it's a very important message and everybody kind of needs to do their own part to make sure that we're all safe and that this virus can kind of, we, we can kind of keep it under control. Yeah, I think you're you're uh, right, doctor. I got to point out, though, when I just, and this is just purely anecdotal, just when I look around me, uh, you know, the millennials are doing all right. Uh, the Gen Xers, are not so much. I, I've seen a lot of <laughs> yeah. people kind of discard their masks now that they kind of feel like, um, uh, I don't know if it's a fatigue or if it's after seeing, you know, all the protests and different gatherings that they just have sort of decided, oh, it, must, it might not be that bad if I do it around the 20 or so people. I consider friends and family. Um, yeah, I, I've been pretty disappointed and shocked, but I recognize we live, we work and live in this news bubble, so we get all this information, like you pointed out, that a lot of other people don't get. And so I'm very aware of the risk, perhaps more aware than, than others. Um, I want to bring up one more thing before we got to let you go. Um, the MMR vaccine. Uh, so now there's this idea that perhaps yeah. it might offer some added protection. I don't know. I was trying to look up very quickly just how long the MMR vaccine has been kind of a widespread vaccine that many people would get, and if that's perhaps associated with why younger people seem to have some sort of protection. Mm -hmm. But what do you make of this news of the MMR vaccine? I think it's absolutely fascinating and really, really interesting. Uh, so the MMR is the vaccine for measles, mumps, and rubella, and we tend to, to give it to all children at the at 12 months and then at between 12 and 15 months and then four years of age. And it's also recommended for some women of childbearing age. So it's interesting because if you look at the data, women are less likely to get coronavirus and less likely to die from coronavirus. So the question is, could it be because they're more likely to have gotten a recent MMR dose? And that could also explain why children are less likely to get a coronavirus and die from coronavirus because they recently got MMR doses. So if you, if you look at the, the Navy, they had a huge outbreak on the USS Theodore Roosevelt. They had almost a thousand sailors catch it. Only one was hospitalized, and the one of the theories is that maybe because they had just gotten all of them had gotten recent boosters of MMR. So it's a fascinating uh, concept and it's a fascinating theory. People think it's because well, number one, it kind of ramps up your bone marrow. It's, it's what's called a live attenuated virus. So it's actually the virus can't can't make you sick, but it's actually a live virus. So you you, you actually catch the virus, mm. but you don't get sick from it, and. One of the theories is that it, it ramps up your bone marrow, but it specifically ramps up some cells called MDSC, which are myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And those tend to kind of ramp down the, the overwhelming sepsis that some people get. So it keeps you from getting septic. So the question is, is it because of these cells that people who recently got MMR potentially won't get sick or won't die from it? It's a fascinating theory, and it's really, really, really interesting. I would encourage everyone to, to look into yeah. this because it's an absolutely fascinating thing. It sounds really interesting. Uh, Dr. Elfenbein, thank you so much. Thank you.